Hello and welcome again to the Rider Review. This is Eric Karat Rider, and this week we're going to be taking a look back at the 2014 animated fantasy action movie titled How to Train Your Dragon 2. Now, How to Train Your Dragon 2 runs for one hour and 42 minutes long. It is directed and written by Dean Dubois. It was produced by Bonnie Arnold. It is based off of the children's book, How to Train Your Dragon, by Cressida Cowell. It is composed by John Powell, and it is edited by John Carr. And it features the voice talents of Jay Baruchel, America Ferreira, Gerard Butler, Kate Blanchett, Craig Ferguson, Christopher Mintz Plassey, Digimon Honsu, Jonah Hill, TJ Miller, Christian Wig, Kit Harrington, and Randy Tom. In 2010, DreamWorks animated feature How to Train Your Dragon was released, and at first glance at that film, I was reluctant to see it because it looked weak and way too kid-friendly for my tastes. Remember, I'm 45 years old. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm some kind of a kid-friendly movie snob who will just dismiss it. No. If there is some great story and some great narrative and, and plenty of things to talk about, then it's got a then it will take a liking for my tastes but i went to see it and i admit i was wrong it was actually a pleasant surprise so in 2014 the sequel how to train how to train your dragon 2 came out and from the trailers this time i had high expectations to see it but feared it would not measure up to the original. And I've never always said I was always right. In fact, I've been wrong quite a lot of times. But fortunately, it held up to the bar of the original quite splendidly and had a satisfying aftertaste once the credits rolled. Sometimes, maybe it's best to go, when you see a movie, it's best to go watch it with low expectations. That way you won't get disappointed, and you may probably even find ways to appreciate it more. It's not necessarily mean you have to be cynical about it, no. But at the same time, you shouldn't always just judge a book by its cover. Just take whatever's taken for granted and then try to expand as the reason why you liked it or why you didn't like it. And, uh, you know, as they always say, as the old saying goes, to each their own. One of the principal attributes of this movie's success is that it managed to be quite bold in its delivery, which is something that was contrary to the first movie. Rather than, rather than just repeating everything we saw from the first installment, writer-director Dean Dubois, who had to go at it solo because fellow co-director from the previous How to Train Your Dragon film, Chris Sanders, had committed himself to the movie The Croods. He decided to make the characters five years older from the previous movie, and to change the dynamic forward in order to keep it newer. And in some ways, that's great. It's actually kind of original, you know, when you think about it. In animation, characters never age. They could either evolve or devolve, whichever way you look at things. But they always still manage to stay the same age. Think of The Simpsons. They've been on for 33 years, and maybe some characters may have altered a bit, evolved, devolved, whatever. No matter what, they're still going to stay the same age. 
Sure, their voice actors are going to get older, but not the characters. And probably if The Simpsons is still on the air, they could even be still around even after the voice actors go meet their maker. They'll just get another person to replace them. Simple as that. But here, we actually see the characters age. Not drastically, but, you know, from compared to five years pr previously. So that doesn't mean necessarily you're going to just, you know, like, aggressively age. I mean, some of the adult characters are not going to get, you know, like, full, complete gray Santa Claus beards or complete white hair. No. Nothing like that at all. Just slight, just slight aging. Don't have to go overboard. I mean, the main character, Hiccup, was 15 years old in How to Train Your Dragon. But in this movie, How to Train Your Dragon 2, he's actually now 20. The other characters have also shown a bit of age, not too much, but... But just enough to sort of keep the narrative going. And, you know, you know, of course this movie could be like a standalone instead of a sequel. Because, like I said, we have newer, fresher ideas, new creativity, and a new storyline. You know, this is one of the main biggest weaknesses in sequels is that sometimes they just... Take the original story and then just recycle it all over again. And it's pretty much starting from starting from square one. And it's just eat, sleep, breathe, repeat. That's all we get. Here, we get something new. We get something fresh. And this is something that I can gravitate to. Well, the previous film ended with the Vikings learning to embrace love with the dragons... The sequel sees the creatures as an acceptable commodity to their society and our teenage protagonists have become older, responsible adults. Which is always a great thing. Because then we can have a new story instead of just starting from scratch all over again. That's not a sequel then. That's just a reboot. That's the way how sequels should be done. Yes, people get older. Yes, we have to learn to adjust and move forward. Could be for the better, better or it could be for the worst. Either way, it just runs nat. It just makes everything all the more natural in that sense. I was greatly impressed with DreamWorks' animation in the design to make the characters older, which is a bold move because in the history of animation, characters never age, or if they do, it's very slow. Sure, they didn't go to extremities about it, just to continue the story five years after the original. Meaning that though the characters have aged, it was only very slightly and while the characters have gone advanced in age, so has the visuals. Only this time as a change for the better. Because let's face it, the visuals look a lot more improved. But then again, compared to 2010, 2014's animated animation had improved quite substantially. This movie was visually stunning. And I also like the idea and the fact that the movie is not just set in one particular area, but it expands a little more globally. Well, maybe not globally, but, uh, you know, different parts of this. It's not just, like, cramped or isolated in one place. They're almost, you know, practically we're over everywhere. That's what I'm getting at. Deeply inspired by the C Star Wars sequel, The Empire Strikes Back, Dublois, Dublois wanted to make the movie stay true to the kid-friendly atmosphere like the original movie, 
But here in the sequel, he wanted to add more mature and more personal issues to go along with the narrative. And some of these are more are more better executed than compared to some of the other scenes, like I'm going to mention soon. But here, in the sequel, he wanted to add more mature and more personal issues to keep along with the narrative. The primary plot is about the Vikings who work along the dragons to take on an enemy whose purpose is to enslave them. Led by a character named Drago, voiced by Digimon Hansu, whose purpose of world domination is to enslave dragons and make them an enemy amongst the Vikings. The emotional arcs are open, but they are not over the top, and never once does it come across as too dialogue inducing and that which becomes quite distracting and mundane for fans who want to see action and comedy in this movie. For example, it doesn't depict any romantic subplot involving the relationship between Hiccup, voiced by Jay Baruchel, and Astrid, voiced by America Ferrara, and doesn't try to add conflict to drive the wedge between them like so many movies try to do with happy relationships. They always seem to do that. Put a wedge between them and then they start arguing and moaning and bitching at each other. And then they come to some kind of a climax which actually reconciles them. You know, some kind of spell that breaks or some sort that comes to the realization that they are true lovers and, you know, have to go out and prove themselves or things like that. Nope, here it doesn't. It's a little shame that Astrid is pretty much pushed to a background character, which is disappointing. Disappointing because in the first movie, she was pretty much up front. But I understand to save time, they decided to refrain from any kind of romantic atmosphere between them or to get into some kind of a conflict which tears them apart. Now, in this movie, they're pretty much a happy couple. And it's so refreshing that nothing here fears them, tears them apart. The main conflict comes to life here is the torn apart relationship between Hiccup and his dragon companion Toothless. This is actually where you see a lot of um, deeply, deep, heavy-handed subplot here about... The torn relationship between Hiccup and Toothless. You see, apparently, Toothless was put under a spell by an evil Bewilder Beast. And the Bewilder Beast put some kind of spell on Toothless, and Toothless eventually turns rogue. And he starts his web of fire. Uh, get it? Dragon? Fire? I mean, trouble. And, um, uh, things just don't look up. And it's just a sad thing, too, because I've always felt that that Hiccup and Toothless are strong have a strong companionship. Very similar to a little boy and his dog. This this is actually very heartbreaking when this happens. Fortunately, Toothless does eventually have the spell broken and he's back again feeding off of the hand of Hiccup instead of biting the hand off of him. See, in this movie, even though dragons are not exactly... Something you would normally keep as a pet. I know, I know that it's fiction. There are no dragons that exist in this world. At least not that I know of. But anyhow. It's just that when a pet turns against you, it can be heartbreaking. 
And I'm glad they didn't go to the direction where Hiccup has to kind of slay his former friend just to make the world a better place. No, they didn't go through that. They did eventually break the spell and Toothless and Hiccup were back again as best buddies. And that's what I like about human pet relationships. Because they each have as much trust and admiration for one another. And it just breaks your heart when one of them turns against you. Because they always had such great chemistry. Sure, the film is saturated with an ensemble of supporting characters. They still provide a great deal of importance to the narrative and keep the flow of the story going, whether it's through comic relief, brief scenes with them doing fun stuff, like dragon races or things like that. But they're kind of kept to a minimal capacity and are not updating the main plot of the story. I wish we could have learned more from these supporting characters, but we don't. Even though this movie lives up to the same levels as the original How to Train Your Dragon, there are a few flaws that did not sit well. For instance, the leading villain, Drago, played by Jimon Hansu, was sadly underdeveloped, mainly because he came late in the, into the story and seemed they spent too much time building upon his character. I mean, it's fine that if you your villain character was a beast and, and it showed up at the last second, then I could be somewhat intrigued. But here... He's not necessarily a dragon, but he is still a very evil man whose purpose is to have cult, uh, cult world domination. And the, only way, and the only way he could do it is through... Um, let's not get into what you have to go to to make these kind of sacrifices. I would have thought it would be better if he showcased his evil ways rather than just telling us personally. Sometimes visuals work better than communication. But then again, visualization is a communicative principle as vocalization. But I want it more visuals than vocals. I would have never thought it would be better if he showcases, okay, then showcasing his evil ways rather than tell, rather than just telling us personally, Drago would have been a more effective antagonist. The same could be said of the mysterious dragon rider, who eventually is really revealed to be Volca, voiced by Kate Blanchett, and it got you wondering and saying, "Where did she come from? Who is she?" And why the fuck is she even in this story? And why did she abandon Hiccup when he was young? Yes, apparently Volca is Hiccup's estranged mother. You see, one of the things about this movie is the relationship between Hiccup and Volca, being that Volca, who abandoned Hiccup, Throughout most of his life. Assuming she was dead. Comes back into, into their lives. And is expected a quick apology. Well you know what? She eventually got a quick apology. Now you're probably saying this like. Why are you so vexed? Yeah but. Where was she all these years ago? And why is Hiccup is like, he questions her and then he's like, nah, it's all good. No, my friends, no. She abandoned you. You should be more assertive about it. You should be more interrogative towards it. You can even show a little level of resentment and maybe even a bit of a stuck up type of persona. 
Or do you have that much self-control that you just look at your mother who abandoned you for 20 years and just say, meh, whatever. No. You should have a little bit of, well, not necessarily overly induced aggression. You could be sarcastic. You could be snarky. You can even be a bit debative. Not necessarily combative. No, I don't want fights. I don't condone that kind of thing. But uh, more or less... More or less have them squabble while at the same time trying to protect each other because underneath all that arguing and hostilities, there is a signs of love and compassion. You could do it that way. Not just question her and then just forget about it after and never mention it again. And believe me, I'm actually a guy who forgives. I could forgive people for spilling... Chocolate syrup on my pants. I won't be too happy, but I won't be like eternal grudge. It just works out better that way. It feels awkward. But the way they resolve the differences is really off putting. I mean, she was absent for most of his childhood, and that should have had a bit of resentment with, the, with Hiccup. But after five minutes, he's pretty much okay with that. Which is a bit awkward. I mean, his father, I believe his name was Stoic. At least he tried to confront her a little bit. Put their differences aside for a bit. And then he gets killed off. So there's no payoff. Towards this estranged relationship between Valka and Hiccup in the end. She's just pretty much welcomed with open arms without a single flinch. I mean, this is a serious issue we're facing. It's still childhood abandonment, and not all issues are settled with a brief explanation. I wanted to see more conflict in the subplot, with some form of rejoicing in the end. Sort of like Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade in which Indy and his father would conflict with each other constantly while still showing love for each other by rescuing each other from danger. Only in, only in the end do they embrace a love for each other. That was what you call picture-perfect unfit mother-abandoned-son relationship. I would have not minded a bit of that. Maybe they didn't want to do it on account of prejudice. Or two, this was just some kind of agenda of some sort. Sure, the, ins the first installment in How to Train Your Dragon 1 is far better. But this sequel, Part 2, holds on effectively. By taking the sequel to a different direction... By way of maturing the characters in age and situations, it could still pass as a standalone movie. Though some improvements could have been fleshed out a bit, it didn't ruin the film at all. The movie was made with a consider considerable amount of care and compassion, making this movie a very useful and reliable sequel, and they're not doing it to cash in from the sequels of the original. The success of the original. It's doing something new, exciting, and fresh. And for that, if I was to give this movie a scale out of 10, I would give How to Train Your Dragon an 8.5 out of 10. I highly recommend you to see this one. So I guess this ends my writer review. Thank you all for listening in. If you wish to subscribe to my channel, please feel free to do so. If you wish to leave a comment, go right ahead. Just remember the three simple rules. Be kind, be courteous, and please refrain from any rude comments. And I will be back again with another movie review. So until next time, this is Eric Karat Writer saying, keep watching those movies, and I'll see you around. Goodbye.